Good morning, Freedom House. How many of you are on a Krispy Kreme donut high? Come on, be honest. Yes, those things are amazing, aren't they? Well, we wanted to give those to you because you guys are so awesome. You braved the half inch of snow today and you sprung forward on top of that. So you are just like the elite spiritual bunch. You are the remnant. So you are amazing. So we wanted to make sure that we honored you this morning. Well, hey, I am excited because I, uh, I have just been anticipating Liberty 17 that's coming up the 25th and 26th. And for those of you who heard me speak a few weeks ago, you heard me talk about my Shiro, my girl crush, Joyce Meyer, and how much I love Joyce Meyer. And you probably also heard how she invited me to come and hang with her in Florida. Well, that was this past week. So I think you should see a picture, don't you? Don't you think that you should see a picture? All right, so you're gonna see a picture there. Joyce and Dave Meyer. Isn't she the best? I just love her. Well, we are actually partnering with her ministry, and we are going to make sure that Classrooms of Hope is something that we connect with because in the Eastern Cape of Africa, which, by the way, is one of the poorest areas in Africa, it's also the wettest and the coldest, there were all these children who were out on the streets. They weren't being supervised. They weren't being looked after. And Joyce Myers Ministries, they said, well, what can we do? How can we participate and help these kids to not just run around the street, these small children? What can we do to help make their future better? So they started off by feeding them. They started off by giving them a safe, dry place to come in because that, that climate there and that area is cold and wet the majority of the time. And then they said, you know, we really wanna make sure that there's longevity in these children's lives. Let's, let's start teaching them the word of God. And then after they started teaching them the word of God, they said, well, why don't we teach them practical things? Why don't we teach them the alphabet? Why don't we teach them their colors, their numbers? Why don't we give them an education? So that is what they have been doing. And we are actually partnering to go in and put classrooms there. So I'm excited the, the 20, what is it, the 25th and 6th. That weekend is when the Liberty Offering is going to be happening. There's one of the classrooms right there and the children. They have anywhere from 20 to 70 kids that will show up. So we're actually believing God that we will be able to build multiple classrooms. How many of you guys are believing with me? And then on top of that, it's not just important for us to do things around the world, but we wanna make sure that we're taking care of our city as well. So we are planting a church in South End, and that will be opening very, very soon. We wanted to make it as hard as possible for people in Charlotte to go to hell. Do you know statistically most people only wanna go 10 minutes from their home? So we said, Lord, we want to make sure that we are able to go in and we are going to be, you're going to see Freedom House Church everywhere. I mean, if you've ever sat in a 1030 service, you know we go out all over the world. We have, there's only two states in the United States, and I don't know which two, but I shall find out that have not and do not watch on a continual basis. So we are gonna make sure that it's hard for people in Charlotte, North Carolina and around the world to go to hell. Are you with me? So be praying about what God would have you to do to be a part of that. Uh, we are in a series right now called Counterculture and I just love it. I love it, love it, love it. Because our culture is trying to feed us something right now and we need to learn and know how we can go against what our culture is saying and make sure that the word of God is our foundation. Not what we're getting on CNN or Fox News or through Google or Facebook News, but that we are getting our information from the word of God. The word of God is true and powerful and strong and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And that should be our foundation. So let's talk about our foundational scripture for this series. It's Romans chapter 12, I'm gonna start in verse one. This says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you, thank the Lord, because we're gonna need God's help to do this, right? 
Take your everyday, take your ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, and you're walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit in without even thinking. Instead, instead of just fitting in with the culture, here's what you need to do. Fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you that's always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best in you and develops well-formed maturity in you. You know, our culture today is trying to teach us that we need to redefine certain things. The Bible says is that this is marriage, it's between a man and a woman, but our culture is trying to redefine what the Bible says. You know, our our culture is trying to tell us that even though the Bible says that God created them male and female, they are trying to tell us that you can pick whatever you want to be, whenever you want to be, however you feel like in the moment, you can just identify. As a matter of fact, my, my husband shared this last week that on Facebook now, when you get onto Facebook, there are 51 different gender options that you can now choose. Our culture is trying to dictate to us, but what I've found is that there are certain things I'll swim with culture. I love fashion, I love design, I love certain music, but I will not swim with anything that goes against the word of God. No matter how delicious and how beautiful they try to package it and serve it to me so I'll eat it, I will not go along with anything that goes against the word of God. And see, here's the thing I wanna tell you today is our culture has gotten really sneaky. They've gotten really sneaky. They realized whoever controls the dialogue will win the argument. So they have started to figure out how they can manipulate words in order to get you to feast on what they're serving. They have figured out that whoever controls the dialogue will win the argument. Whoever controls the language controls the masses. So, okay, so let's think about that for a second. What would be some examples of that? Well, you know, I was born in 1971, and as I was growing up, you know, we kept hearing about this thing called abortion. Abortion, abortion, abortion. You know, but then things started to change. They didn't call it abortion anymore. Then it was a woman's right to choose, because why would you ever want to take away a right from somebody when they get to make a decision? Why would you want to render them powerless? So we're not going to say that because we're having a hard time getting the masses to believe us. So what, what if we say, hey, you have a right to choose. Don't you want to be in charge of your own body? Well, gosh, why, yes, I do. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I don't want anybody telling me how to control my body. You're right. Women, we need a right to choose. It is our right. And we start taking it hook, line, and sinker simply because they just changed the wording and here we are dining and feasting on it and eating it. And here's the thing, listen, if you have had an abortion, I am not here to condemn you, okay? What I am here to do is to let you know that there are people who right now are attacking our words, changing the words, and that attack on words is actually an attack on our ability to think. 1.5 billion babies since the 80s, just since the 80s, have been aborted. 
That lets me know we're buying in to what culture is selling us. And we need to understand. We won't even say that it's an unborn baby because, see, that might bring some consciousness to us. That might bring some conviction. So what if we just twist the words there, too? What if we just called it an unviable tissue mass? See, then I'm disconnected from it, and I don't feel guilty. I can do what I I want. I can make the choices that I want because I am a woman and I have a right to choose. Do you see how society feeds that to us? Okay, what what about this? It used to be called a strip club. But you know, who wants to go to a strip club kind of sounds like a little strippish. So why don't we call it a gentleman's club? And if we call it a gentleman's club, you will come. You will actually feel like a gentleman when you go in and watch girls swinging on a pole. You will feel like a gentleman because that's how we're serving it to you. Instead of homosexuality, we don't say that because the masses weren't going for it. So why don't we just say Equal rights, would you want someone to not have the same rights that you so freely enjoy? Surely you're with this. Oh yeah, wait, do I want someone to not have equal rights? Okay, I, I'll, I'll go with it, I'll go with it. Don't you think love should win? Oh, you're right, you're right, I'm gonna go with that. And we start swimming with culture and we have no idea what we're even participating in. I was in a hotel this week and I was flipping through and we get to the the part of the, the channels when you go higher and it doesn't say pornography, you wanna watch? It says adult entertainment. They're switching around the words so we take it in, so we ingest it, and they're fooling us. And hook, line, and sinker, we are taking the bait because we don't understand. You see, the attack on words is an actual attack on your ability to be able to think. Before somebody just hands you something on a silver platter, think about what is it really? What is this? Is this godly? Is this okay with the Bible? No matter how much you turn it, no matter how much you change it, did you know 90% of the media, 90% is owned by six companies and they are dictating to us. And somebody's got to stand up and say no more. And I'm not talking, I'm not talking about getting in fights with people and being ugly and nasty. I'm talking about standing up for what's right. Standing up for the word of God. We got to start using our words. You know, the words we speak will become the house that we live in. Do you like where you're living? Do you like where you're living? Culture is always trying to get us to feed on certain things. And what I thought I would do is I would go and explain and share with you the things that I think they're coming in underneath. Because some of the things that I just explained to you, those are a little more overt. I wanna go a little more covert and show you some of the things that our culture is trying to get us to buy. And I want you to know that we can be counter culture. There's five different things I wanna share with you that culture's trying to get us to take. The first is culture rejects correction. Culture says, don't correct me, I'm a free thinker. I'm a free thinker. You don't have a right to correct me. I've got my own opinion. Let me tell you what Proverbs 3, verse 12 says. It says, for the Lord corrects those he loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. You know, for those of us in here that are parents, we understand that correction is necessary and vital in order for our kids to grow. We understand that without correction, our children stay immature. 
We know it's important. We know it's necessary. We understand how needed it is. We understand how valuable it is. But something happens when we grow up. Something happens where we understand that our kids need it, but what about us? What do you do when you get corrected? What's your stance? What's your posture? Maybe your spouse corrects you. They see something in your behavior that needs adjusting. Maybe a boss, a friend, a coworker. How do you handle correction? Can I tell you that in the place that I sit, I have to do a lot of correcting, okay? Not just as a pastor of thousands of people, okay? But I also am a boss who has employees and we have interns and I have children and I have teenagers in my house all of the time. My life looks like correcting a lot. But do you know what? 90 to 95% of the people have no idea how to be corrected. If we understood that correction means that we are loved by God, we would be thankful instead of all the things that we are when somebody corrects us. We would say, oh my gosh, thank you so much for showing me that because I know that God doesn't just, you know, correct me this way. He corrects me through you. Thank you so much for saying that to me. Let me tell you the stance that most people take. I wrote down all the things that I could think of. This is how most people handle correction. They get angry when you correct them. How dare you? They get fearful. Do you, do you still love me? They feel rejection. Do you even care about me anymore? Shame, resentment, maybe they buck up and get rebellious, which you can see sometimes in teenagers when they get corrected. They can feel devalued when actually what you're doing by correcting them is you're trying to add value to them. They can get defensive or be in denial, withdrawn, embarrassed, complacent, nonchalant, prideful. I'm never wrong. You know what this tells me? This tells me we got a, a, a lot of work to do, that we need to bring our children up where they make friends with correction because the Bible says that a parent, a wise parent, will make sure they're correcting their children so they are delivering their soul from hell. Correction is vital, it's necessary, it's needed, and not just for little kids, for us too. For us too, you know, I have a friend, um, he's actually a counselor and he goes in and he works with church staffs and he, he came in and he worked with our staff one week and he was, he was trying, to get a, trying to get a feel for our culture and our temperature here, you know, our ability to be able to not just be corrected from the top down, but to be able to give correction, you know, sideways. You know, can you correct your peers and can you guys have good relationships? And he was telling us a story. He said that um, he has a little a group, like a little dinner club. There's about 10 couples and they always get together. He said, but one couple, their kids act crazy. And nobody wanted to invite them to anything anymore. But nobody was telling them. They just stopped inviting them. He said the kids were, you know, running around the house. They were going up and down the stairs. They were going into his cabinets. They were jumping on the furniture. So all of a sudden, they just got left off the invite list. And he said, but I realized that that wasn't right because no one even had a conversation with him to tell him why. All of a sudden, he stopped getting invites for his family to come over. He said, so I realized I had to love this guy enough and risk me being uncomfortable to tell him the truth. I mean, how do you tell somebody, your kids are the reason you're not getting invites? I mean, that's a little hard, but you know what? He loved him enough where he wanted him to be able to participate and not be alienated. And the truth is, is it wasn't his kid's fault, it was his lack of parenting skills. So he went to him and he told him, and at first the guy got agitated at him, 
Two days later, he came back and he said, thank you for loving me enough to tell me what everybody else should have but didn't have the guts to. Isn't that how we should do real life, where we love people enough to tell them the truth and to add value? If my kids were acting like knuckleheads, I'd wanna know. So I could change, so I could grow, so I could learn. You know, culture says that we need to reject correction, but counterculture says we need to be teachable. We need to be teachable. The moment you become unteachable is the moment you better unpack your bags because you're gonna be staying right where you are for a very long time. You stop growing to the place where you become unteachable. So counterculture says we're to be teachable. I tell my kids all the time, don't be a know-it-all, be a learn-it-all. Don't be a know-it-all, you be a learn-it-all. Make friends with correction. The second thing in culture, they want us to be offended. Culture wants us to be offended. They want us to be offended with each other. They want us to be offended with our, our neighbors. They want us to be offended at work. They want us to be offended at church. Culture wants us to be offended. I cannot turn on my TV and not resist the urge to be offended. Is anybody else honest in here to say that you have to really guard your heart when you're watching the news? Okay, I mean, they've got Democrats shouting, Republicans shouting, everybody's offended, everybody, everybody's doing stuff against each other, yelling and screaming. And then they got the men and the women trying to be offended at each other. They're telling all the women, listen, the men are trying to hold you down and keep you under thumb and you're not getting paid as much as the men for the same job. And they're trying to stir up this offense. Do you know why they do it? because we keep getting glued to the TV to watch it. Look, let me make sure my rights are being, oh, oh, who's, you know? And then let's just be honest, the black-white thing. Our culture right now wants us offended with each other. They want us angry at each other because the devil's trying to slip this stuff in to divide us. We know that the color of our skin doesn't matter, but let's be honest, when you're watching this stuff, I was watching a new show and I got mad at white people. I'm like, what are those white people doing? This is crazy. And then the night that we had the shooting here in Charlotte, I'm, I'm driving home and my kids, my younger one called me and said, mom, why are the black people burning stuff and, and, and flipping things over in the streets? Why are they angry? What's going on? I said, turn it off. I said, turn it off. Because that is what the news, that is what the media is trying to portray. And I said, that is not something we will allow into this house. Our brothers and our sisters are our brothers and our sisters, and they want us offended. So we'll keep tuning in, finding out who's trying to put us under now. Who's against who? Well, you know, everybody's trying to watch a good fight, right? So they get us offended, so we take the bait, and we think that everybody's out to get us. And I told my kids, we will not watch that trash. Shut it off, turn it off. My daughter is 15 years old. I said, I have spent 15 years raising you to never look at anybody other than your brother or sister. I will not let some news program tell you anything different. Shut it off. And I'm talking about both sides of the aisle here. And you think, well, what authority do you have to say that because you're a white woman? I'm a white woman who has been pastoring a multicultural church since I was 26 years old. I am 46. I can speak on this. I have watched the devil try to come in and divide and twist and enough is enough. We have got to show him the door, to show him the door. And I had, I mean, think about this. I had a, a young man come talk to me. He's uh, friends with my, my daughters. And um, he's, he's a light-skinned black man. And he came to me because he was hurting. 
He said, I'm, I'm not white enough for the white people and I'm not black enough for the black people. Where do I fit in? And I said, we have created this. Our culture has created this. So guess what? If we're the ones that made the mess, we're the ones that can clean the mess up. If we choose not to be offended. The Bible says in Luke 17, one, it is impossible that no offenses should come. It's not a question of opportunity to be offended, but what will your response be when you get that opportunity? You know, the word offense right there in the Greek actually means the Greek word scandalon. It's the Greek word scandalon, and it means the bait inside of a trap. And I want to show you what this looks like, okay? I have a picture, and I paid $15 for this picture, so you will like this picture. <laughs> there it is. That is a bear trap. And that apple, the trap is not offense, okay? The apple is offense. What the apple is, is the apple looks juicy and delicious and tantalizing, and it makes me want to go and grab it and get a hold of it. But there is a trap that has been led, that has been laid out for me. And if I take that offense, boom, it's closing on me. If I take the bait, if I take the bait of Satan and I go in and I grab that opportunity for offense, it will close in around me and I am trapped. But what God is saying, he's saying, say, hey, I want you to recognize what this is and I want you to step away. I want you to walk away. Don't take the bait. I'm telling you, that's a big one. I've watched people leave churches, leave marriages, leave you know, relationships because of offense. Don't take the bait. How do I know if I'm offended? That person's name is on your lips more than it should be. How do I know if I'm offended? You would rather have pity more than you would want growth. You desire pity more than you desire growth. How do I know I'm offended? When you aren't praying for someone earnestly, but you're talking about them. I'm gonna tell you, if you were to go home and look in my bathroom right now, I have a little index card of those people who have stuck a knife in me and twisted it. And I pray over them every day. Because I know as long as I'm praying over them, I will not be offended, I will not be talking bad about them. And here's the thing, I probably, just the position that I'm in, I have a lot of opportunity because there's a lot of people that can take shots at me, okay? There's a bullseye, but I refuse to engage. I refuse. I, I am gonna pray for them. I'm gonna believe God for them. And it's really hard to be talking against somebody when I'm praying for them. How do I know when I'm offended? Because you won't listen to wise counsel. Offended people rarely see themselves as offended. You know, the church in Laodicea in Revelation, Jesus, you know, there was a letter, Jesus spoke to them and he said, listen, you see yourselves as this. You see yourselves as rich, you see yourselves as wealthy and having need of nothing. But can I show you how you really are? You are wretched, you are miserable, you are poor, you are blind, and you are naked. You see, they were unable to see themselves for what they really are. That's why wise counsel is so, so important. So how do we, how do we counter how do we counter this culture of being offended? We counter with forgiveness, being forgiving. We let go of hurts quickly. It doesn't mean that what the person did should not bother you. 
It means it shouldn't stay bothering you. Deal with the situation, cut bait, keep fishing, move on. Don't stay offended. Also, here's, here's something that really helps me. How do I keep being forgiving? Always assume a benevolent motive. Always assume a benevolent motive. How else? This is a good one too. Don't become emotionally attached to your perspective. The last one, accept imperfection. Not just yours, but theirs as well. Number three, our culture says to dishonor. Our culture says to dishonor. You can say what you want about who you want whenever you want, and it's okay. You can say bad things about your boss. You can attack the president. You can attack spiritual leaders, your spouse, your coach, your kid's teacher. You can talk nasty about police officers, but let me tell you something. There is not one time ever in the Bible where it says it's okay to disparage leaders or people who are in authority. And it doesn't just say, well, only if leaders treat you well. We are to never, ever speak against authority. What are we supposed to do? Pray for them. We are supposed to get on our knees and pray for them. Hebrews 13, 17 says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Romans 13, one, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. 1 Peter 2, 17, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers, fear God, and honor the emperor. Exodus 20, 12, honor your father and your mother. Listen, I'm not saying that you can't have a disagreement what I am saying is you can't have a disagreement where you're disrespectful. Disagree respectfully. If you don't like something the president's doing, pray for him. If you don't like something that's going on in our military, pray for them. If you don't like what's happening with our police officers, pray for them. If you don't like what's going on with your kid's teacher, instead of writing a nasty note, pray for that teacher. Maybe she's going through a divorce or had a hard time. Maybe your one act of love and reaching out would change her. But there is not one scripture in the Bible, not one, that says it's okay to disparage someone in authority. Now listen, all authority is from God, but not all authority is godly. Okay? But we still have a responsibility to pray. And let me ask you this. If you're having a hard time getting your kids to honor you, check how well you're honoring others. Because like produces like. All right. How do we counterculture that? How do we counterculture dishonor? We are to honor. What does honor mean? To esteem something highly. Dishonor means to treat something as common. So when we honor, what we are doing is we are esteeming something as significant. Let's treat our relationships with significance. And I'm gonna run through these last ones because our, our time is a, a little off today. But number four, our society would tell us to worry. Our culture tells us to worry. But what is the word of God said? The word of God says to trust. To trust. Counterculture means to trust. You know, I'm gonna tell you, it used to be that um, the rule in the sales industry was that sex sells. Do you know they've changed that? 
It's no longer sex sells. They realize sex will get your attention, but it doesn't sell. It's actually worry and fear that sells. And marketers know this. If any of you work in the marketing industry, you know this to be true. So here's what happened. It used to be, oh, well, if we put a scantily clad girl on a, you know, Mercedes, then we could sell the Mercedes. No, 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 attention would come to the Mercedes, but you wouldn't sell it. Now, how do you sell it? You make people think that if, if you don't buy this car and you don't have the right traction and you don't have the right airbags and your steering is not just right, your kids won't be safe. You could have an accident. You, you could harm your family. Oh my gosh, I need to go buy that car. Is there a matter of fact, um, this is just so interesting to me, but uh, Listerine, when they first came to be a company, they only had $115,000 worth of sales. They were trying to figure out how do they boost their sales? How do they get their sales higher? So what they did is they said, okay, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna tell people, we're gonna make up this word called halitosis. It was not a word until Listerine made it up. <laughs> Google it, check your facts, there was no such word. We're gonna make up this word called halitosis. And not only do we not want you to have bad breath, but did you know there's millions of little bugs and germs that are crawling around on your tongue and in your mouth and all over. And if you don't use Listerine, they will stay in your mouth. Do you realize that they went from literally 115,000, you can hold off on the guitar, I'm a little, I'm a little behind. I'll tell you, I'll tell you when. <laughs> Do you realize they went from 115,000 in sales to eight million because we didn't want bugs in our mouth? And they made up a word. They do it over and over and over, over and over and over. But in Philippians 4, 6, it says, be anxious for nothing. Sorry, Don't, Don't worry. worry. Trust. Trust with your finances, your children, your future, your health. Trust in the Lord. All right, number five. I'm going to give you this one quick. The culture says we are to be rebellious. We are to buck against everything. Even Burger King tells us we can have it our way. It is our way. It's all about me and how I want it. Let me read you this story. Prior to the Civil War, the government wanted to test the use of camels as desert transportation for military equipment and supplies versus horses and mules. They ended up acquiring 70 camels from Egypt and the testing ensued. The camels surpassed the horses and mules in practically every single area how much weight they could carry, how much they performed in inclement weather, rough terrain, how much distance they could cover, everything. In the end, the decision was made not to use the camels. Huh, but they outperformed the horses and the mules. Well, in spite of the fact that they had exceeded in most challenges, they scared the horses and the mules and all the animals in general. The soldiers could not bond with the horse, but no one, or the soldiers could bond with the horse, but no one was able to bond with a camel. The camels bit, the camels spat, the camels made noises when they walked, and their personality would not connect with anyone. They were rebellious. In other words, ability and accomplishments are not the most important thing. We have to know how to counter rebellion with submission. What is submission? It's not a weak word. It's power under control. It's power under control. Jesus was powerful. He submitted to the will of the Father. He was not weak. And you know what? Submission doesn't even begin until there's disagreement. If you and I are in agreement, you're not submitting to me. You agree with me. Submission doesn't even begin until there's a disagreement. And character is exposed in contradiction. Will you stand up on your feet with me? I, um, you can play that guitar now. <laughs> Thank you. I was a... Uh, 
I was driving my car and every time I'd go around a corner or a curve, there was um, this swishing sound. It sounded like I was driving a boat instead of a car. And it was like a lot of water. And I kept driving, I'd turn, water, everywhere, water. And I was like, something is really off. I mean, I, I couldn't tell that anything was wrong with my car. My car seemed okay. But it literally sounded like I was on the ocean and I wasn't, I was driving down the street. So I took my car in and I got it looked at and they were like, hey, um, ma'am, well, we, there's actually a little helicopter that had broken off and slid down into your window. Do y'all know what a helicopter is? I brought a piece. There you go. That's a helicopter. The little helicopter had slid down in the window, gone all the way down to the only little tiny hole that happened to be in the entire door, jammed itself in the door so whenever it rained, water couldn't just pass through and water had filled up my car door. Something so little, something so small, something I wasn't paying any attention to that I didn't think was a big deal had slipped in on me without me knowing it. And by the time I got my car fixed, they told me another inch and it would have wiped out the electrical system in my car because it was almost at the part where the electrical unit is. Something so small, something so tiny that I didn't even know was able to weave itself in. You know, some of us, we, we're here in the swishing. And we need to find out what little thing we need to adjust or unplug so we can get back where God wants us to be. For some of you, 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 you may not have a relationship with God at all. For some of you, you may just need to come back home. And then maybe some of you are just saying, you know what? I just need today. I just want to be that person that, that lives their life counterculture. Would you just bow your head and close your eyes? In here today, if one of those three things is you, you say, man, I just need, to, I just need a little checkup right now. And in any of those areas, you know, in my life, my heart with the Lord, Lord, help me not to swim with the current, but maybe go counterculture. If any of that is you, would you just quickly lift up your hand? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your hands. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody else just want to put your hand up? Thank you. Thank you. Father, I just thank you for each person in here. God, I thank you that in matters of style, Lord, you don't mind if we swim with the current, but God, in matters of the heart, we will stand strong and we will stand firm. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name.